service station welcomes you to another baseball broadcast brought to you direct from Comiskey Park by permission of the Chicago White Sox and the Boston Red Sox to stimulate interest in our national game and in your local team. And now to Comiskey Park and Hal Totten, who is going to give us some inside information on today's game right from the playing field. Take it away, Hal Totten. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon from Comiskey Park, the home of the White Sox in Chicago, where the White Sox and Boston Red Sox are going to play a Ladies' Day game to open up the series of four games to be played in three days. The uh, crowd this afternoon is laughing in ecstasies right now because Al Shack is out here putting on his toe-dancing act at third base, and he's going to have a lot of other funny things happen before he's through. He'll really have himself an afternoon and keep people in hysterics. He just did the stunt of catching one, uh, letting one ball go, and uh, then... Uh, throwing another one as though he'd fielded it and now he's sitting on third base and catching throws from Frank Groove and now he gets up and throws the ball backwards without looking but the throw is a little wide usually at this time before the start of the game we have a little chat with a ball player but I'm going to try something a little bit different today right down here along the front of the stand and you know you people who are out here a lot you know there's a number of faithful rooters that are here day after day and day after day and they've been here, a lot of them, for many, many years. One of them's a young lady down here. I don't even know the young lady's name, but I'm going to just fool them all, and I'm going to talk to them today. What is your name? Marge Kirby. Marge Kirby? Yes. And uh, how long have you been coming out this fall park? About 10 years. When you were, you started when you were about six years old. Just right? about. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, how long have you been a Sox fan? About 10 that years. Of How'd you start being a fan? Oh, I don't know. I just came out here and... You really are a real I'm Sox, Sox fan. fan. I, when they were down, I was with them, and I'm with them when they're up. Well, I'll give you credit. I know you were, because I used to see you here every day right down here in this same seat right here alongside the bench. You never missed, did you? Who's this young lady alongside? What's your name? Ann Maltie. Ann Maltie? Maltie. And uh, how long have you been coming to these games? About 10 years. You've been coming here 10 years, too. And uh, are you a real Sox booster? Why, why, do you so. two, why do you two people like the Sox so much? Well, we just like them, I guess. And you have no answer as to what is a fan, is that it? fan is a person that's with a team when they're down, and they're still with them when they're up. And they don't, uh, don't throw pop bottles when they're No, in. we don't throw pop bottles. <laughs> but we'd like to, but we don't. I'm going to go on down the line here a little bit farther, because a couple of other ladies, that, this is sort of ladies' day, so we've got ladies on here. Can I bust in here and, and uh, ask you to say something for a minute, you okay. two fine people? And what, what, what's your name now? Uh, I'm going to ask you your name. I know it, but you're supposed to tell them. Mrs. Here. Adams. Mrs. Adams. You were on the air with me downtown once and you asked me questions. everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Say, I want to ask you something, and uh, I really mean this deeply. How long have you been coming to games out here? Well, out here. Ever yeah. since uh, the year after I moved to Chicago, that'd be about four years. And, uh, but you've been a baseball fan before that? Well, Mother says I, she took me in her arms. <laughs> <laughs> you've been going ever since. Uh-huh. Well, how did you come to be so interested in the Chicago team, you say, the year after you came to town? Well, the first year I lived in town, I couldn't get around very well. I'd been kind of sick, and I used to turn the radio on. I used to get this man called Totten. I always wondered who he was, you know. Uh-huh. And uh, then I listened to him, and I thought, well, doggone, I used to like baseball. I'd better go out. And then when they told Jimmy Dykes out here, you know, and I listened to that, I thought, well, sure enough, I'll have to go out there. Sure enough. What's that sure enough come from? Why's your home? Oh, kind of all over. I live a long time down in Virginia, though. You live a long time down in Virginia. Oh, <laughs> I like that. Well, then radio really maybe has something to do with your coming out here. I tell you, right? I think radio... I think radio not only teaches the game to people that ordinarily wouldn't learn the game, gets them interested in it, but you get hot about the team, you got to come out and see them. You're here pretty near every day, aren't you? Well, as often as I can get out now here. Now you're on a path, either. No, sir, I'm the not. radio hasn't hurt the attendance as far as you're concerned. Not as far as I'm concerned. Right. I only wish they gave the games while they were away, because as hot a fan as I am, I lose a little interest while and they're gone. In other words, you're uh, really a Sox fan rather than just a baseball fan, is that it? No, I'm an American League fan. Oh, American League fan. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> but that's a real a... White Sox fan. Yeah, well, that's you know. what I wanted. This young lady next to you, what, what, what's her name? Huh? That's what I'm going to ask you, how long you've been out here. <laughs> what is your name? Donald Sutherland. And uh, how long you've been coming out here? Well, you? since I was six years old. And believe it or not, that was in the old White Sox Park. Oh, down in the south of here. Yeah, oh. <laughs> I was going to go way back. And, uh, let's see, six I years saw Red Saber pitch his first game in this ballpark. Well, you shouldn't admit all that. I know, things, I shouldn't, but after all, there it <laughs> because is. Because I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't. <laughs> Probably not. I don't think I was even in Chicago then. Well, that's how far back I was. 
Because I've never been in the old park. And now I think I heard you broadcast the first few games on an old battery set. 1923. I won't say how many years ago it was, but we had a battery set at the time. And that's what everybody used to say. The World Fair is coming up. Everybody get your batteries charged. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's get what your batteries was. charged up or get a new yes, one. Sir, that's that's like <laughs> uh-huh. Well, uh, that was before the days of Texaco. Now, uh, as far as radio is concerned, of course, Texaco is that old, too. But uh, then uh, you people are really Sox fans. Absolutely, the word Al. We've been coming out here for all these years, and I think that we'll keep right on coming out. I'd like to know, and maybe you people can help me find out, just why Sox fans are so constantly loyal and why they stick the way they do. Just what is it about the Sox team that keeps you people so intent on the club, whether they're winning or losing? Well, Al, yeah, because it's just our club, that's all. Well, not well, only that, the management's it. always so nice, and they, not like today, look, all these girls out here to see the game, and you never have any trouble. You're always a customer, and the customer's always right, and your team's in there, and whether they're in last place or first place, they're out there giving everything for you, as well as Mr. Comiskey. Well, you can't help but like them. That's a perfect answer, and I'm glad to hear you say it, because, uh, you know, uh, I've lived on the north side ever since I was in Chicago. In fact, when I first lived on the north side, the Cubs were on the west side, and then I was a Sox fan. Then when, that was when I was a little boy in school. And then the Cubs moved to the north side, and, of course, we kids had to be Cubs fans then. And then we started broadcasting. You remember the first two years the American League wouldn't let us broadcast? Oh, you weren't up here then. You remember that. And then finally, uh, so I got the reputation of being a Sox, a Cub fan. I had more fun the first year in here at the Sox Park. Every time I walk out the Sox fans, oh, what they call me. <laughs> but now I've uh, finally persuaded them that we've stuck to them you know, through thick and thin, and the boss and everybody else like. Oh, what is this? Anyway, Al <laughs> Shacks is putting on his tennis game here, and he's doing it all by himself. He ran almost all the way out. Let me, he's got the Suzanne Long Long effect with a long uh, gown on. It looks like a nightshirt of some kind, sort of abbreviated. And he's going way down with slow motion now to come up toward the net. And he's got the crowd cheering for him as he does this slow motion business. Of, and he bows, and the crowd gives him a big hand as he cuts off the field. Thank you, ladies, for uh, a very, very nice broadcast. And uh, uh, I think she really told the fans something. Now, that's better with a hat down. She took her, turned her hat up so she could get a, uh, the microphone under it, I think. <laughs> Now, ladies and gentlemen, here are the lineups for today. For the Boston Red Sox, Cook, right. Kramer, center. Manush, left. Fox, first. Kramer, second. Conan, short. Werber, third. Bird, catching. And Cole, pitcher. For the White Sox, Radcliffe, left. Krivich, center. Hawk, right. Appling, short. Hyatt, third. Sewell, catching. And Lion, pitching. Right now, a little uh, White Sox mascot is sitting on Al Shack's knee like a the uh, dummy in a ventriloquist act, you know. And... Uh, <laughs> Al's looking at him and making him do all sorts of stunts for the benefit of the cameras. That ought to make a good picture of that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I think I'm going to have to encounter a lot of traffic on the way up to the booth. So I'd better get underway pretty soon. I might add again that it's another one of those days like the last two. Sunshine, clear, warm, but a nice breeze blowing from the northeast, making it worthwhile all the way. But that's all for now. And uh, while I'm on the way up to booth, George, will you just do a little switch at the studio? Here's good news for your pocketbook. A great new motor oil, the new Texaco motor oil made by the new Perfurol process, is now on sale at all Texaco stations. What is the Perfurol process? It's a special refining method developed by the Texas company which washes out all non-lubricating impurities, giving to the new Texaco motor oil a stronger, tougher lubricating film, a film that resists burning up inside the engine. This oil film keeps the crankcase full longer because because it is all lubricant. Gum-forming elements and all other non-lubricating materials have been removed. Ask for the new Texaco motor oil with the new Perfurol film at any Texaco station. And try a tank full of Texaco Fire Chief, the emergency type gasoline. This powerful driving combination will bring out the best in your car, and it will at the same time save you money. Now, while Hal Totten is on his way up to the booth to bring you this afternoon's baseball game from Comiskey Park between the Chicago White Sox and the Boston Red Sox, 
We'll give you the schedule of the other games to be played this afternoon. First, over in the American League. Well, let's start in the National League, and as much as the American League is in town. In the National League, the Chicago Cubs are in New York today, playing another game with the Giants. That game has already started with French and Hartnett, the battery for the Cubs, the Giants starting Gumbert and Mancuso. At the end of the second inning, the score is tied with no score. In Brooklyn, the St. Louis Cardinals are leading the Dodgers at the end of the first half of the second inning, 3 to nothing. Dizzy Dean pitching for the cards with Ogredowski behind the plate. The Dodgers using Brant and Barry. In Boston, the Pittsburgh Pirates are leading the Bees at the end of the third inning, 2 to 1. Weaver on the mound for the Pirates with Patton catching. The Bees using Chaplin hurling and Lopez behind the back. Southie today in the National League there's a doubleheader ball game between the Phillies and the Cincinnati Reds. The first game is already over with the Reds coming out on top 12 to 2. The box scores, the Reds score 12 runs, 14 hits and one error. For the Phillies, two runs, six hits and two errors. Walters and Atwood went the entire route for the Phillies with the correction for the Reds with the Phillies starting Davis and Lombardi. Harris pitching in the sixth. Stivus in the seventh. And now for the American League. There are no batteries and no scores with the exception of from Comiskey Park and the batteries out there for the Red Sox, Grove and Bird. And for the White Sox, Lions on the mound and Sewell catching. The schedule in Detroit, the Tigers take on the Washington Senators. In Cleveland, the Indians play the New York Yankees. And in St. Louis, the Browns take on the Philadelphia Athletics. An opera look at the standing of the club. In the National League, the Cubs are in first place. They've played 93 games this year. They've won 57 and lost 36. Second place, the St. Louis Cardinals, only one game behind the Cubs. Third, New York Giants, whom the Cubs are playing today. They're six games behind the Cubs. Fourth, the Pittsburgh Pirates, eight and a half games behind. In fifth place, the Cincinnati Reds, 11 games. Sixth place, the Boston Bees, 13 and a half. Seventh, the Philadelphia Phillies, 20 and a half. And in eighth place, the Brooklyn Dodgers, 23 and a half games behind. And now in the American League, first place is held by the New York Yankees. They've played 98 games this year. They've won 64 and lost 34. In second place, the Cleveland Indians, whom they're playing this afternoon. The Yanks and the Indians will play this afternoon. And the Indians are seven and one-half games behind the Yankees. In third place, the Boston Red Sox, who are at Comiskey Park, they're 11 and a half games behind. Fourth place, the Chicago White Sox, 12 games behind. If the Chicago White Sox win this afternoon, they will be in third position. In fifth place, the Detroit Tigers, 12 and one-half games behind. They're just one-half game behind the Chicago White Sox for fourth place, and the White Sox are one-half game behind the Red Sox for third place. In sixth position, the Washington Senators, who are playing the Detroit Tigers today, and they're 15 games behind. In seventh place, the St. Louis Browns, 34 games behind, and the Philadelphia Athletics are in eighth place, 31 and one-half games behind. The games this afternoon will have a very deciding effect upon what positions will be held tomorrow, as of starting tomorrow. And now for a look at the home run situation as it stands today. Lou Gehrig is still in first place. He's had 32 homers this year. Fox of the Red Sox, who's out here at Comiskey Park this afternoon, has had 29 three games behind the lead. The second place is also shared by Trotsky of the Cleveland Indians, who had two home runs yesterday, and he also has 29. And in fourth place, Mel out of the Giants with 21. Back to the ballpark, ladies and gentlemen, and ready to start the ball game. The Sox team is out there on the field, but Ted Lyons finishing his warm-up. <clears throat> We have Sewell, who now throws the ball out to second base, and we're just about ready to get this ball game underway with the first hitter for Boston being Dusty Cook, a left-handed hitter with plenty of speed, good power, and a good all-round ball player. He's up there at the plate as Lion Stock is wind up to pitch the first one. Throws, and Dusty takes a strike over the outside corner about knee high. One strike on Cook. And Lyons winds up again, throws. Dusty swings the foul, this one back to the screen, and it's strike two. And makes it two strikes on Cook. Two strikes to count.
Set again, starts to wind up. Throws and Dusty swings, hit the ball right back through the box and into center field for a base hit. Single to center field by Cook. Putting him on first base with nobody out in the first inning for the Red Sox. And Kramer, Roger Kramer, the Red Sox center fielder, another left-handed hitter, at bat. Kramer's one of the boys, as I think you know, who came to the Red Sox from the Athletics during the winter. <clears throat> Lyons is ready, throws the first one, and it's a fast one for a ball that just missed the inside corner across the knees, and it's one ball on Kramer. And there's a strike over the outside corner across the knees. So it's one and one, one ball and one strike on Kramer. Ryan says he's time once more. He's ready to pitch. Pitches. Rod swings. Hit one also into center field for a base hit. Runner from first round. Second starts for third. But a good fast throw from previous to Appling. Chased him back to second base. Well, these boys start looking as though they're going to go out and then both of them drive that ball straight through the box. Ryan must be right straight over that plate. While it's Balls are going on the ground or low. They're going safe. Now the Red Sox have runners on first and second. Nobody out. And Manush, another husky dangerous left-handed hitter, steps up there, taking the first pitch wide for ball one. Lyons throws again, and Heine swings in a pop fly going foul to the left of the plate. Wind carrying it back toward the stands. This back well into the stands, out of reach for a strike. So it's one ball and one strike. One and one is the count. Pitcher finally swings around, steps on the slab again. Pitcher looks back at second base and throws, and it's an inside across the chest for ball two. So it's two balls and one strike. Two and one on Manoj. And the pitcher throws and Heine swings in a pop fly out toward right field. Hayes is back on the edge of the grass. And so the man is called out on the infield fly rule as Jackie Hayes catches the ball anyway. Infield fly rule had him out. The umpire near second base. I believe it is. Let's see how we line up today. Hubbard at the plate, McGowan on first. And our old friend Emmett Ormsby is on third base. Emmett come into town and takes the place of Quinn, apparently. And now the first pitch to Jimmy Fox, Husky right-handed hitter at bat, is a good strike one over the inside corner down around the knee. Jimmy's a boy to hit a ball clear over the left field stand out here in the last trip. He falls the next one back on the net back of the plate, and it's two strikes on Fox. Two strikes to count. Lyons stands there getting his time, getting ready once more. Finally has it. It's looked back at second base. Pitches, and a hitter hits a long one. It looks like it's in a way, way back. And it's a home run into the second deck, way back in the second deck. On the left field stands by Jimmy Fox, scoring two runners ahead of him to give the Red Sox a 3 to nothing lead. That ball was a mighty wallop way out there. Lyons must have let the ball get away from him and pitch it where he didn't want to because he certainly pitched the ball right down Fox Alley. And it's a long home run for Jim. High into the second deck of the left field stand, which scores three runs for the A's. Uh, for the Red Sox, been talking about the A's so long, getting mixed up. And the Red Sox are now leading three to nothing. All seem to get away from Ted because both he and Sewell, after the ball was hit, were standing there dejectedly as though to say the ball didn't go where it was meant to. And now Croner, who's playing second base, right-handed hitter, takes the first pitch wide for ball one. Ted throws again. He swings and misses a high fast ball inside for a strike. And it's one ball and one strike on Croner. One and one the count.
Ryan throws again. Croner hits a long drive to left field. Radcliffe's going back, and he has it way back near the wall. Ball well hit, but Radcliffe got back nicely to make the catch. So it's two out in the first inning for the Red Sox. He runs already home, though. And the next man up is Werber, Bill Werber, the Red Sox third baseman. Throws the first one, so high on the inside for ball one. One ball called on Cronin. Joe Cronin, the shortstop manager at bat, right-handed hitter. I said Werber was up. I skipped the name there in that lineup. My mistake. And the next one is a strike over the heart of the plate, a little above the knees. So it's one and one. One ball and one strike on Cronin. Ryan throws another ball wide for ball two, and it's two and one. Two balls and one strike. Ted goes through that swinging windup, throws again, and the hitter gets the third ball, a fast one that slips inside across the waist, and it's three balls and one strike on Cronin. Lines winding up, pitches again, and the hitter swings, hit a ball, foul down the right field line, and well back into the box seats, way down the line. It's three and two, three balls and two strikes on manager Joe. Then goes through his windup pitches, Cronin swings, hit a ball down to Platt. Gets it nicely, throws the first, and Conan is out for the third out in the first inning. And Lyons, after a one bad pitch, ball that apparently he threw in the wrong place to Fox without intending to, <clears throat> got through the inning without further damage, but that damage was considerable. Three runs, three hits in the first half of the first inning, and the score is three to nothing in favor of the Red Sox as the White Sox come to bat in the last half of the first inning. Rat Cliff, who walked out of the dugout just then, was greeted by the nice round of applause from the lady fan. Stocky little left-handed hitter who is the White Sox leadoff man and is second to the league standings today. Went back ahead of his teammate Appling yesterday and is trailing Gary, girl Averill, who was up there for a day or so, dropped back down under the first pew. And there's the first pitch to Radcliffe, a strike over the inside corner about waist high. One strike is count. She winds up again, throws, and hit her swings, hit a bounder back to the left of shortstop. Cone gets it near second base, throws the first, and Radcliffe is out for the first out of the first inning, bringing Mike Krivich to bat. It's a right-handed hitter, stands there waiting. And Grove winds up and pitches for a strike over the outside corner, waist high. Grove still got that easy, graceful pitching motion. And still uses that system of smoothing down the dirt in front of the rubber before each pitch. Here's strike two. Fastball also over the outside corner, waist high. And it's two strikes on Crevis. Two strikes to count. Rolf throws again. Mike swings and misses a curveball inside, striking out for the second out in the second inning. Oh, Colonel Kirsch down there. Harry Kirsch back in town. He spotted Judge Doherty, Charlie Doherty, wandering around in here to see the game. That old Colonel Yank here today, too. Colonel Taylor. Yank Taylor's wandering around here in the second deck with us. Hitter hits the Haas, hits the first ball pitch to him. It's a slow bounder, which Conan can't quite get back to second base. He snaps his fingers as though he is disgusted with that one. Because he thought he might have gotten the man if he did uh, field the ball. And I believe it will go as a base hit, because I doubt very much if Conan could have made the play. You haven't seen sign yet from... Uh, 
Wayne Otto, who probably will sign it in a minute. And now the first pitch to uh, Benore is inside and low for ball one. One ball called. That's on that, George. Please. The hitter hits the next one, a long foul away down the right field line and hits the front of the roof of the sand, bounds out into the inner right field where one of the boys from the Boston bullpen gets it and rolls it into Merv Shea coaching at first base. And it's one and one. One ball and one strike on Benura. He swings the next hit, a looping drive down the right field line. It's going to fall for a base hit. There it does, inside the line. And Benura is... Uh, at second base, and the runner from first is going home as Benora turns and goes all the way to third base on it. The ball bounded away from the right fielder down the line and uh, rolls along the front of the stand. By the time he recovered it, Toss had scored from first base, and Benora pulled up at third. Well, we'll give him a hit on it and give him three bases on that one. Hit on the other and triple on this one. Wayne Otto isn't there, you say. The official scorer is not present. Well, I... Huh? Well, if he was there, he'd relay him over. I know that. Well, anyway, it's one run home, and Appling at bat has one strike on him. Rope throws again, and Luke takes a high one inside for ball one. Wait a minute. He didn't have one strike. The board showed one strike, but I didn't remember any pitch. I was going along with the board, and the board was wrong, and it's Correct. So now it's one ball on Luke Appling. And there's the next one for ball two. A little bit wide across the waist. So the count is two and nothing. Two balls and no strikes. On Appling. Grove winds up again. Pitches. And the hitter falls this one into the stand to the right of the plate for strike one, making it Two balls and one strike on Luke Appling. Benora on third base, two out, one run home in the first inning. Score three to one in favor of the Red Sox. Two and one on Appling. Grove getting ready again. Starts to wind up once more. Throws and Luke starts to swing stop. The ball hits the bat and then bounds ball back to stand. And it's two and two. Two balls and two strikes. Appling turns, walks out of the box, dry his hands, and steps back up to the plate. And Luke swings again to foul this one high into the second deck above and the right of the plate. And it's still two balls and two strikes on Appling. Still two and two. Balls and two strikes. If he throws once more, and there's another foul onto the roof of the stand above and to the right of the plate. It's still two and two on Luke Gaffney. <clears throat> Old Luke balling him off again. Grove again starts to wind up. He pitches and Luke swings to drive another one out to right field for another base hit. Past the right fielder and into the stand down the right field line to go for a two-base hit by ground rule. And naturally it scores Benura easily from third base to make the score three to two. Double down the right field line by Appling. Scores Benura and the score is three to two now in favor of the Red Sox. With a tying run on second base. Appling on second base, two out, two runs home in the first inning. And Hayes, Jackie Hayes at bat. Grove throws the first one, and Jackie hits a high fly to left field. Looks like an easy out, though. Manush is waiting under it. He has it. And it's three outs. Two runs, three hits, one man left on base in the last half of the first inning. And at the end of the first inning... The Red Sox are leading the White Sox by a score of three to two. For a longer-lasting, sweeter running engine, use nothing but new Texaco motor oil. 
Texaco is most economical because it gives more lasting lubrication, saves engine wear, and actually increases your oil and gasoline mileage. New Texaco motor oil stands up under heat and fast dry. Its purity is guaranteed by the refinery seal can. Try new Texaco motor oil. If you haven't tried it before, try it today, and you'll see the difference right away. Bill Werber, the Red Sox third baseman, is the first man at bat in the second inning. Bill is the right-handed hitter. Lyons starts to wind up the pitch to him. Throws, and he takes a wide one across the chest for ball one. One ball called. Lyons winding up again. Throws. The hitter swings. Hit one down the left field line. A beauty just inside the bag. Goes way on down to the canvas down there. Radcliffe. Fights around amongst the front of the stand and in amongst the canvas, and he finally gets a hold of the ball and throws it in. And it's a double down the left field line by Werber, putting him on second base. Nobody else in the second inning for the Red Sox. And Mo Berg is at bat, right-handed hitter. Good old Mo was with the White Sox for a number of years, back some years ago. Started with him as an infielder, and then in an emergency one time when all the catches were hurt, he volunteered to catch, and has been a catcher ever since, and a very smart one. Mo started to swing at the first one, stopped halfway through, and it breaks wide for ball one. One ball called. It's ready again, throws, and it's a wide one across the waist for ball two. The count is two and nothing, two balls and no strikes on first. A shrill whistle you hear is Al Shack coaching down there. Now the hitter on the hit-and-run play with a runner on the go from second base drives one out into left center. Radcliffe tries to field it but just manages to tag it with his hand and it rolls on now and out there in front of the scoreboard and the runner keeps right on for third base and uh, the throw comes into Appling. That was funny. The ball scooted in under the bottom of the scoreboard there and with Radcliffe and Krivich both looking for it, they... Uh, suddenly discovered it popping out from underneath the uh, scoreboard and bounding on out toward center field and Krivich had to chase it and throw it in by that time Burt on third base. So it's another run home and a runner on third for the Red Sox in the second inning and the White Sox start to warm a pitcher up as Grove, who is a pretty good hitter himself, steps up there and swings wildly at the first pitch of curveball to miss it for strike one. There's ball one high and wide, and the count is one and one. Incidentally, when he was with the White Sox, Berg and Ted Lyons were very great pals. They were together a great deal. It throws again for strike two, a fastball over the heart of the plate about knee high, and it's one ball and two strikes on lefty throw. White Sox infield playing right in close, hoping to cut off the run at the plate. And there's the second ball, a fastball wide across the chest. And they get two balls and two strikes. On Grove. Berg on third base. Nobody out. One run already home in the Red Sox now leading four to two. Lyons throws again and Grove swings hit a pop fly out there in front of the plate. Luke Sewell is down there getting it. Makes the catch and it's one out in the second inning. Sewell got the ball about six or eight feet out in front of the plate. And so it's one out in the second inning for the Red Sox. Berg still on third base. One run in. And the leadoff man, Dusty Cook, is at bat once more. Again, the infield stays in close. Try to cut off that run at the plate, but the right side of the infield backs up a little. Hayes and Venora, because Cook pulls the ball pretty good. She winds up, throws, and the hitter takes a curveball inside for ball one. One ball called. Winds up again, pitches the hitter, hits the slow bonder down to Hayes, who holds the runner at third, and then tosses the ball over to first base, getting Cook for the second out. Makes it two out in the second inning. And Kramer. Roger Kramer, the center fielder, is at bat. The infield now naturally backs up to normal position to play for the batter for the third out. Berg still on third base with two out, one run home in the second inning. Starts to wind up. 
Pitches him, the hitter starts the swing, stops to twist the weight and take a pass one inside for ball one. One ball call. Winding up again, pitches, and the hitter swings it about and out. Appling and grabs it, throws the first base, and although Benora had to lean way out to the left to get the ball, he made the catch on a nice reaching play for the third out, ending the inning, and Lyons pitched beautifully there after getting himself in a serious jam at the start of the inning by allowing a double and a triple. He pitched himself out of the jam with only that one run scoring the first run of the inning. Had Berg on third base with nobody out and couldn't get him home. One run, two hits, one man left on base, and the White Sox come to bat in the last half of the second inning with Tony Platt, the third baseman, the first man up, and the score, 4-2, to two, in favor of Boston. And Oscar Melillo's out there warming up the drove while Bird gets into his catching cog. Walks slowly up there to the plate. He throws the ball out to second. And... Uh, Croner, the rookie, tossed it to Cronin. Cronin throws it back to Croner after rubbing it up. And Croner returns it to the pitcher. Now Grove takes it, looks over, and throwing it up all to his bare head. As Pyatt digs in that plate, ready to be the first man at bat in the last half of the second inning. Grove starts to wind up pitches, and it's a curveball inside and low for ball one. One ball call. Winds up again. Throws and the hitter swings. Hit it, bounded down to the shortstop. Cronin soaks it up, throws the first, and fires out easily for the first out in the second inning, bringing Luke Sewell to bat. Sewell finishes swinging three bats, tosses two of them aside, steps up to the plate. And the pitcher starts to wind up, throws, and it's a fast strike over the heart of the plate about waist high. One strike on Sewell. One strike at the count, it's ready again, starts to wind up once more. Throws and Sewell swings in a foul going into the stands above first base, and it's strike two. That ball landed on the roof of the stand. Strikes now the count. Grove winding up again. Pitches and Sewell hits the ball out toward right center. Goes through for a base hit. The outfielders are chasing it. Lucas around first base. He's rounding second base, heading for third. The center fielder caught up with the ball but couldn't grab it. And it rolled on through to the scoreboard. And Sewell pulls up at third base on a triple to right center. That's his second triple in two days besides a double. When Sewell hits that ball out there, it uh, is pretty well hit. And when it lands, it doesn't lose any of its speed, but keeps right on going. As a result, the right fielder and center fielder who had left that space wide open, right fielder playing near the line, center fielder over in left center, had to chase it. Kramer managed to tag it as it rolled past him, but couldn't grab it. And so it got through and put Sewell on third base. First pitch, Ted Lyons. Now it's bad is inside across the waist for ball one. Ted switches around and is hitting, depending on the pitching. So he's batting right-handed against Groves, left-handed throwing. Ted steps out of the box, throws a little dust on his hands, watches Grove for a moment, finally steps back up to the plate. Archie's wind up. Pitcher pitches, and it's a strike over the inside corner, waist high, to make it one and one. One ball and one strike on line. Lines again steps out of the batter's box. And they're watching the pitcher finally steps back up the plate. Grove is winding up. He throws and Ted swings and misses a fast one that breaks down inside. And it's strike two. One and two. Grove winding up once again. 
pitches, and Ted swings and misses a fastball inside, striking out for the <laughs> third out. The catcher dropped the ball and stood there holding in line and started just sort of jogging toward first base. And finally, Berg turned through the ball down there, so that completed the play. And it's two out in the second inning for the White Sox. Sewell is still on third base. And the man at bat is Radcliffe. He starts to wind up, throws, and it's a curve ball wide for ball one. One ball called. There's the side again, starts to wind up. And throws and rip swings in a high fly and a short left center, but the center fielder Kramer's in there. He's waiting under it, makes the catch, and it's three out. And that time they didn't get that man home from third base. So it's no runs, one hit, one man left on base. And at the end of the second inning, the Red Sox are leading the White Sox by a score of four to two. Broadcast of the White Sox Boston game comes to you direct from Comiskey Park, home of the White Sox in Chicago, as a presentation of your neighborhood Texaco dealer, distributor of Texaco Fire Chief Gasoline. The broadcast comes with the permission of the White Sox and the Red Sox to stimulate interest in our national game and in your own local baseball team. This is WCFL at Chicago. Remember, Still get your Texaco scorebook by stopping in at any Texaco dealer, asking for a request card, filling it out with your name and address. It's already addressed to me on the other side. Put a one-cent stamp on it and mail it. The book contains not only the special scoring pages for 17 games, but a complete scoring system, illustrated and explained carefully. Manoush is about to start the third inning, and the first pitch is inside and low for ball one. One ball called. Lions ready again, starts to wind up. Pitches, and the hitter swings and misses a fast one inside for strike one. And the count is one ball and one strike on Manoush. Dangerous left-handed hitter. Powerful fellow. Lions throws again, and Heine swings the pop foul into the stand to the right of the plate. And it's one and two. One ball and two strikes on Manoush. Throws again now, and it's inside and low for ball two, making it two balls and two strikes. Sewell cocked his arm back as though to throw the ball to third, apparently thinking that ball might have caught the inside corner, but it didn't, and so it's two balls and two strikes on Manoush. Two and two. Lance takes an easy swinging wind-up. Throws again, and the hitter takes it behind inside for ball three. White Sox really want this game this afternoon. If they can win this game, they go into third place in the league. They're only half a game behind the Red Sox. Throws again. Manush hits the bounder down to Jackie Hayes. He gets it on a short hop. Throws the first. And it's one out in the third inning. One out in the third inning for Boston. And Jimmy Fox hit that mighty home run in the first inning with two men on base. Is it back? Fox up at the plate. Fox takes a strike over the heart of the plate, waist high. One strike at the count. The swing hit the next one. Platt goes to his left, gets it on the bounce, throws the first, and Fox is out easily for the second out. He makes it two out in the third inning for the Red Sox. And Croner is up there at the plate. Croner, the Red Sox second baseman. Throws now, and Croner takes it over the plate with low for ball one. One ball called. Lines up again, throws, and it's a strike over the outside corner about knee high. So it's one and one. One ball and one strike. And there comes ball two. It's two and one, two balls and one strike.
Swings again to hit a long hopper. Flag grabs for but it gets through into left field. Took a bad hop, went through. He was going way out to left. And it's a base hit for Toner. Ball is gone and passed by it. He couldn't quite get it out there. And it puts Toner on first base with two out in the third inning. And Cronin at bat. Swings hit the first ball pitch. It's a high fly in the short right center. Haas is in there to make the catch and makes it easily for the third out, ending the first half of the third inning with no runs, one hit, one man left on base for the Red Sox. And the score stands at 3 4 to 2 in favor of the Red Sox as the White Sox come to bat in the last half of the third inning. Ladies and gentlemen, sitting alongside of me here is the young man who uh, has done, well, I don't know, he seems to have made me quite famous or tried to lately. A lot of you people may have seen him or heard him. And uh, ball players from visiting teams and home teams that were in Chicago a couple of weeks ago when he was playing at the Chicago Theater all came to tell me about an imitation he does, an impersonation. Now, he does a lot of impersonations, but he seems to be impersonating a sports announcer, baseball announcer named Ty. Now, uh, his name is Frank Payne. He's turning down at the college in also. And Frank is out here, and I told him, uh, swore at him, that he was going to have to go to work today if he came out here. Now, listen, Frank, you come up here and do a half inning, and let's see, I want to hear how I sound. And then the fans can write in and tell me if you really make it sound like me. Mike Kravitz is the first man at bat. That's the Grove standing out there getting his sign. Starts his line up. Throws, and Mike takes one wide for ball one. One ball on Krivich. Grove is ready once more. Getting his sign out there again. Starts his line up and throws, and Mike swings hit the ball down the right field line, but it's foul. Bounce up against the stands. One of the boys from the bullpen gets it and throws it back into Mervyn Shea, who's coaching at first base. Two strikes on ball one, strike one on Krivich. Throws out there once more. Starts his windup. Throws, and it's ball two. Probably a little bit high over the plate, but too high. And it's two and one on Mike Krivich. Two balls and one strike to count. Lefty Grove is ready once more. Starts his windup. Throws, and the hitter hits the ball on the right field for a good clean base hit. Single to right field by Krivich. And Cook gets the ball, throws it into second base. That was a nice single right field by Mike Krivich. Puts him on first base with nobody out in the second inning. The third inning? What is the third inning? Second inning. Mule Haas at bat. Oh, Mule Haas at bat. That's he grows moving third around out there in the rubber. Stretches, looks at first base. Throws, and Haas takes a slow ball over the plate for strike one. One strike on Haas. Grove standing with his back to the plate now. Now he's ready. Looks at first base. And throws. And it's wide for ball one. And it's one ball and one strike on Mule Haas. One and one is the count. One and one the count on Haas. Crevis on first base. Boston leading four to two. If he throws the next one and it's strike two over the outside corner and it's... One and two on Haas. One ball and two strike to count. Grievich on first base. Throw looks over there. Stretches. Throws. And it's ball two, I believe. Two and two. Throw is ready once more. at first base throws and Haas jumps back to take the third ball inside and it's three and two on Mule Haas three and two the count three and two the count on Haas Grove seems rather nervous out there now he's moving the dirt down a little bit looks at first base throws and Haas hits a bounder down to the third baseman who gets it throws the second he throws the no he didn't throw the first he started to throw but stopped and I don't know. And the runner was out at second. It was a force play from Werber. 
over to Croner. Peavitt slid in light nicely and broke up a double play there. Got the... Croner was off balance and couldn't throw. Big Zeke Benora is up now. And if Zeke can get a hold of one here, it'll be just dandy. Grove won't look at first base. Throws, and it's a ball over the plate for too low. Ball one on Zeke Bonura. Ball one to count on Bonura. One out in the second inning. Grove looks at first base. Throws, and Zeke gets one out toward right field. It's way, way back there, but the right fielder goes back, and he gets it near the wall. That ball is well hit, but it was a little bit too high, and it's two outs. Hus uh, is still on first base, and Luke Appling is at bat. Luke Appling, the hitter. Oh, luscious Luke steps up there. He's waiting. He's batting around 377, I believe. Right up there with the top. So it looks at first base and throws. And Luke hits the ball out of the right field, but again, Cook is back, ranges back easily and gets it. And it's three outs. No runs, one hit in the second inning for the White Sox, and the score remains 4-2 to two in favor of the Boston Red Sox, and here's the real Hal Todd. Hey, you're terrific, my friend, Thank but you. you're right now being at the end of the third inning, I oh, think all right. up to the minute scores, and complete batteries from other cities will return to the studio. In the National League in New York, the Chicago Cubs lead the Giants at the end of the sixth inning by a score of 3-1. to one. French and Hartness, the Cub battery, the Giants using Gumpert and Mancuso. In Brooklyn... The St. Louis Cardinals are leading the Dodgers at the end of the first half of the fourth inning by a score of 6-3. to three. Dizzy Dean, working for the Cards with Ogrodowski behind the bat, Grant and Berry, the opening battery for the Dodgers, with Phelps catching in the third and Winston pitching in the fourth. In Boston, the Pittsburgh Pirates are leading the Bees at the end of the first half of the seventh inning by a score of 7-3. to three. Weaver and Patton, the Pirate battery, Chaplin and Lopez opening for the Bees with Reese pitching in the fifth. The first game of the doubleheader in Philadelphia was taken by the Cincinnati Reds from the Phillies by a score of 12 to 2. Davis and Lombardi, the Red battery the entire route, the Phillies opening with Walters and Atwood, Harris on the mound in the sixth, and Sybus hurling in the seventh. In the second game of the Twin Bill, Brendan and Campbell open for the Reds with the Phillies using Jorgens and Atwood. At the end of the second inning, the score is tied 1 to 1. In the American League in Detroit, the Tigers are leading the Washington Senators at the end of the second inning, 3 to nothing. Newsom and Millies, the Senator battery, the Tigers using Bridges and Hayward. In Cleveland, the Yankees are leading the Indians at the end of the second inning, one to nothing. Hadley and Dickey working for the Yankees. The Indians have Harder on the mound, Fitlack behind the bat. And now back to Comiskey Park and Hal Totten. Take it, Hal. Okay, uh, Frank, go right ahead again. I'm enjoying okay. this rest. Thank you. The first man up was Bill Werber, and he lined out to Zeke Benura. Consider his Berg, catcher. First pitch is low and inside for ball one. One ball on Mo Berg. Headline stands out there ready once more. Starts his wind-up. Throws and Berg swings. Hit a pop fly over near the first base, but it goes back into the stands for a foul. Here comes Eddie Cavanaugh, the ball game's official. Hi, Ed. Eddie Cavanaugh's here. Ball one and strike one on Mo Berg, the catcher. Steps up there once more. Headlines is out there getting his sign. Starting his wind-up now. Throws and Berg gets the line drive way out the center field. But Kriebich is back there, and he gets it. And it's two outs. Two outs in the fourth inning for the Red Sox. And Lefty Grove is at bat. Grove comes slowly out of the dugout. Rolling slowly up to the plate there. Very nice hand from the crowd back to first base. Waiting. That line's out there getting a sign. Starts his wind up. Pitches and lefty swings to miss a low one inside, and it's strike one on lefty Grove. Strike on lefty. Pitches a slow ball over the outside corner for strike two. And it's no balls and two, two strikes on lefty Grove. Line's ready once more. Starts his wind up and throws. And Lefty takes a very feeble swing and misses the ball for strike three, and he's out. And the White Sox are coming to bat now in the last half of the fourth inning with the score remaining 4-2 to two in favor of the Boston Red Sox. Ted Lyons is that first bat inning. He's been pitching nice ball there. So 
Jackie Hayes will be the first man up for the White Sox. Jackie Hayes swinging three bats, throws one of them aside now. And we're just about ready to go. Nifty Grove is still warming up, takes another warm up out there. There's a throw to second. And Jackie Hayes is at bat. Jackie Hayes. Been doing some nice hitting for the White Sox. He's batting around 306, I believe, and he's hitting in the pinches. Lefty Grove is ready out there, smooths the dirt around. Starts his wind up. Throws and Jack takes the first one wide for ball one. One ball on Jackie Hayes. Ball to Conan Hayes. Grove is ready once more. Winds up and throws, and the next one is wide for ball two. And so it's two and nothing on Jackie Hayes. Two and nothing to count. Hayes, the White Sox second baseman. That in the last half of the fourth inning. Here's the next pitch. Ball three, very wide. Three and nothing to count on Jackie Hayes. Three balls and no strikes. Throws ready once more and throws. And it's ball four inside. And Jackie trots down to first base with a walk. Puts Hayes on first base with nobody out in the fourth inning. And the hitter is Tony Pyatt, who's playing third base these days for the White Sox. Tony Pyatt at bat. So looks at first base and throws, and Tony acted as though he was going to bunt, but took one inside for ball one. One ball on Tony Fyatt. Probe stretches, looks at first base again, and then throws, and it's wide for ball two. Well, 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 Mr. Grove seems to have lost his control here. That's six... Straight wide ones he's thrown. Six straight balls. Ready once more. Throws it's a strike. Caught the outside corner. And it's two and one on Tony Pyatt. Two and one to count on Tony Pyatt at bat. In the fourth inning with the Red Sox leading four to two. Jackie Hayes on first base. Nobody out. Grove is ready once more, looks at first base and then throws. And Tony swings it, a ball on the right field line, but it's foul, just curved foul. And it's two and two on Tony Pyatt. Balls and two strikes on Pyatt. The umpire ran down the left field line for that ball. Comes back in again. Grove is ready once more. Throws and it's inside and low for ball three. So it's three and two on Tony Pyatt. Jackie Hayes on first base. Grove is ready. Throws and it's ball four wide and Pyatt gets the base on balls. Pyatt walks. Putting Hayes on second base. Pyatt on first. Nobody out in the fourth inning. And Luke Sewell is the batter. Luke Sewell, the catcher, who hit that triple last inning, but remained on third base when the boys couldn't bring him around. He seems to be the matter out there. They're fooling somebody. I don't know who it is. I guess they're booing Cronin for coming in and arguing about something, I believe, about that last pitch. Gathered around Grove now on the pitching mound. Luke Sewell standing down there waiting. do 
Tony Pyatt's on first base. Jackie Hayes on second. We're ready to go. Luke Sewell at bat. Lefty Grove getting a sign and throws. And Luke takes a strike with a curveball. And the catcher Grove throws to second base. Throws to second base. The runner got back there. And Cronin is... No, the runner is out. The runner was caught off second base. Jackie Hayes was caught off second base on a throw from Berg to Cronin. Jackie Hayes was caught off second base. He's walking dejectedly back to the dugout now. It's ball one on Sewell. Jack had a big lead back there, and Grove, or, uh, Berg threw the ball out there and caught him off. Next pitch is strike one, and it's one and one on Luke Sewell. One and one is the count. One out of the fourth inning. Buy it on first base. Sewell at bat with one and one on him. Red Sox leading the White Sox four to two. Throw looks at first base again. Throws, and the ball gets away from the catcher, but he picks it up in time. It's ball two. Runner couldn't advance. It's a short pass ball, and he got it in time to hold the runner on first base. Now Grove is ready once more, standing there getting his sign. Ready. Throws and Sewell hits a pounder down to the third baseman. Warber misses it. Warber fumbled it, and the runner is safe, I believe, at first base. The runner is safe at first. Warber fumbled it. I believe it goes in air. I don't know. Weber came in for that bounder and fumbled it. Find out in a minute if it was an error or a base hit. This man at best takes a strike over the outside corner. It's Ted Lines, the pitcher. It was an error on uh, Werber, the third baseman. Lefty Grove throws again, and Ted swings and misses one inside, and a strike two on Ted Lyons. Two out in the last half of the fourth inning. Sewell on first, Pyatt on second. The count is strike two on Lyons. Boston leading four to two. Once again, Grove starts that stretch, throws, and the hitter hits one. Down to corner, who throws the second, forcing the runner there, and the throw to first gets past the first baseman. The throw to first got past Fox, and Tony Pyatt scored. The throw to first was very bad, very wide, got past Jimmy Fox, and the runner scored from... Tony Pyatt scored from second base where he had come from, rather. He was rounding third, and he scored on that wild throw. Makes the score four to three now in favor of Boston. Lyons is on first base, and Rip Radcliffe is at bat. Radcliffe the hitter. Two out in the fourth inning. Boston leading four to three. Radcliffe hits the first ball on the corner, who gets it easily, throws the first, forcing Lyons. Throws the second, forcing Lyons, and it's three outs. In the fourth inning. The score still four to three in favor of Boston, and here's Hal Todd. You want me to go to work again, Frank? I don't care. What do you want to do, Hal? <laughs> well, I'll call you in later. Maybe I'll go to work a little while because they'll think uh, that I'm loafing on my uh, job here. It was one run, no hits, two errors, and one man left on base in the last half of the fourth inning for the White Sox, and as Frank told you, the score is four to three in favor of Boston. Summer means more miles of driving, so make them pleasant miles with your car free from nerve-wracking squeaks and rattles. Drive to the nearest, Drive to the nearest Texaco, service. Texaco service station. Tell the operator you want lubrication. He will put oily, clinging Marfac in every bearing, and the job will last twice as long as an ordinary grease job.
That voice that you've been hearing for Ninning and that I'm sure you're going to hear again before the day is over belongs, as I said earlier, to Frank Payne, the noted impersonator who has been doing an impersonation of yours truly at the College Inn and a couple weeks ago at the Chicago Theater, and so we thought we'd put him to a little bit of a job here while he was doing it. The first man at bat in the fifth inning for the Red Sox, Cook, the leadoff man, hit the first ball, pitched down to Benura, and Zeke went over, got it, and crossed the dead lion, and Cook... Ted Lyon, and Cook was out at first base, Ted taking the throw in time to get it. So it's one out in the fifth inning for the Red Sox. And Kramer is at that. Chili, Frank? <laughs> Roger Kramer's up there. Lyon's looking around, getting ready to pitch the first one to Rod. Dodgers wind up throws, and Kramer takes a strike over the heart of the plate about knee high. One strike to count. Lions again start to wind up. Throws for strike two. It's over the outside corner, knee high, and it's... Wait a minute, the first one called a ball, was it, John? It was a ball. I thought it was... I thought uh, the umpire was changing the indicator... My mistake, he didn't wave it. He just was lifting his hand to change the indicator. Now the hitter hits the next one, a slow bounder down to Appling, who grabs for it, but it gets past him. It was a slow one, and he was going to have to make a very fast play on it, and I believe it will be a base hit. It's a very slow bounder, and uh, I believe it will be a base hit because Appling coming in fast and Platt going over tried to get it. The ball is deep past both of them, and the runner was safe at the first base. Almanus is a hard bounder to Hayes, who flips it over to Appling. He scrapes his foot across the base, and it turns into a double play. A double play, Hayes to Appling, to Benora, for the second and third out. Ending the first half of the fifth inning, and the score is it's no run. Hey, uh... George, will you ask Whitey if you'll check on that? Because uh, Wayne is there now, and he called that last one to me. This fellow doesn't look the right place, I don't think. Uh, Wayne is there and calling him and relaying the information to us. I know he's not holding out as he is official scorer and a very agreeable young man. So we don't know whether it's one hit or not in the first half of the fifth inning, but we're checking up to find out. We know it was no runs, nobody left on beat. And the score... It's still 4-3 in favor of the Red Sox as the White Sox come to bat in the last half of the fifth with Mike Krivich, the White Sox center fielder, first man up. Grove steps onto the rubber, gets ready to pitch the first one to Mike. Has the sign, he's winding up. And throws and Krivich takes it inside and low for ball one. One ball called. Pitch is ready again. Starts to wind up once more. Throws and the hitter takes a high one inside for ball two. So it's two and nothing on Krivich. Two balls and no strikes on Mike. again winding up throws and there's the third ball a fastball inside across the waist and it's three balls and no strikes on Krivich three and nothing easy wind up throws and it's a strike over the outside corner about knee high making it three and one three balls and one strike what did he say and now comes strike two, a fastball over the heart of the plate, making it three balls and two strikes on Peter. There, the hitter started to swing at the next one stop, but the ball was over the plate, and Peter is called out on strikes for the first out in the fifth inning, making it one out of the fifth inning for the White Sox, and Haas, the old Haas, is up there at the plate. Haas 
swings the first one to hit a slow bounder over the pitcher's head. Cronin gets it back to second, throws the first, and Haas is out for the second out. That makes it two out in the fifth inning for the White Sox. And Benura, Zeke Benura is at bat. Zeke Zeke up there. Hit one triple today, drove in one run and scored one. Side setting a long fly to the right fielder his second time up. He's up there now with two out in the fifth inning. Drove pitches. And Zeke swings hit another ball to right field. It's going way back, but Cook is back under it and makes the catch easily for the third out. Of course, three out, no runs, no hits in the last half of the fifth inning. And the score at the end of the fifth inning is still four to three in favor of the Boston Red Sox. And now, once again, for just a moment, we return to the studio. If you want to get the greatest enjoyment out of these baseball broadcasts, be sure to get your copy of the 1936 Texaco Baseball Scorebook. Hal Totten's own simplified method of keeping play-by-play scores is clearly explained, and you'll find many pages of score sheets. Use this book for every game. It's great fun to be able to refer to games you've seen or listened to and give a play-by-play record. Then, too, this big worthwhile book carries the roster of both Chicago teams, the pictures of the individual players, their averages, ages, nicknames, and heaps of other real baseball dope, plus a complete schedule of all games for both leagues. It's easy to get your own copy. Just go to any Texaco service station and ask for a request card for the 1936 Texaco baseball scorebook. Then write your name and address on the card, stamp it with a one-cent stamp, and drop it in the mail. That's all there is for you to do. It's absolutely free. So be sure to get your request card in the mail today and start keeping your own play-by-play record of these games. During the broadcast, Al Totten will give you additional dope on scoring as the plays take place. Remember, all you have to do is to sign the card with your name and address, stamp it, and drop it in the mail. And now back to Comiskey Park for the continuation of the baseball game brought to you by permission of the Chicago White Sox and the Boston Red Sox to stimulate interest in our national game and in your own local team. Take it, Hal. Back at the ballpark for the sixth inning, and uh, the inning was held up momentarily. Muehlhaus, after running out that play, had to go back to the bench and was... Still there, had to dug up the clubhouse for a minute, and they had to wait a moment, but he's back out on the field now, and so Lyons took a little extra warm-up, and the ball has been thrown back to him. We're ready to go in the sixth inning. Jimmy Fox, the Red Sox first baseman, the first man at bat in the sixth. The lady fans are having a lot of fun with Al Sack there, who keeps moving the outfielders, waving them back as Fox steps up and motioning into the second deck of the left field seats and all the ladies boo and cheer and have a lot of fun. The first pitch to Fox is an high one inside for ball one. One ball call for Jimmy Fox. Lions winds up, throws again, and Jim swings and follows the ball back to the net, and it's a strike. So the count is one ball and one strike. New ball thrown out by umpire Hubbard gets past Lions. Appling picks it up over near second base. Now the pitcher winds up to pitch the box once again. He throws and Jim takes the ball. It's over the plate but too low. And it's two balls and one strike on Jimmy Fox. He's the first man up in the sixth inning. Red Sox leading four to three. Lyons throws again. The hitter swings in a high fly down back to third base. Going foul. Lyons chasing over to the stands. And reaches way into the stands but it's out of his reach. And <laughs> the mushers grab for it. And two of them grabbed it once as a result ball was fumbled and one of the fans got it down there. It's two and two on Jimmy Fox. The wind blew that ball pretty well back into the seat and out of reach. Must be four o'clock. There's our Monon friend. Did the uh, Pennsylvania whistle a ten minutes up? He forgot us today. Well, the Monon uh, remembered us. We can't. There be. Uh-oh, Jimmy swings hard to the next pitch and misses the ball for a strike. And, uh, Maybe he tipped it. I don't know. He might have. Yeah, I guess he tipped it foul because it hit Luke Sewell's finger and then caromed off and hit the mask. Luke looked at his finger. Fox had started for the bench and then turned and walked back there again. Apparently just barely tipped the ball foul and thought that Luke had held it, but it dropped out of the glove. And as a result, Jim is still up there. He held the ball. It had gone straight into the glove, and he'd been able to hold it. It had been an out. There's the next pitch for a ball high and inside, and it's three balls and two strikes. On Fox. Three and two. 
Lions gun winding up, throws, and Fox swings in another pop foul coming down back at third base, but also well back into the stand. In fact, it lands clear up on the roof of the stand. Down to our left, and it's still three and two on Jimmy Fox. Three and two. She was winding up. And throws and Fox swings it. A beauty out the center field. Way, way out there for a long base hit. Bounding clear out to that door. Out there, it's just south of the bleachers. Fox around second base. Carrying for third. The ball comes into Hayes, who relays it into Appling. And Fox pulls up at third base, standing up. Oh, that ball was beautifully hit. A long triple to center field. They play him naturally around the left. And, uh... Pavich made a great try for it, but it got well past him. Found it out to the door that leads underneath the right field stand, just south of the bleachers, right in dead center field almost. So you know how far it went. And Fox is on third base with nobody out in the sixth inning for the Red Sox. Croner, the second baseman at bat, infield playing in now, almost to the infield grass, left side back a little bit. Throws the first one, and Croner takes a high one inside for ball one. Ball sails a little. And it's one ball on Croner. Throws again, and he fouls the ball onto the roof of the stand above and to the right of the plate. So it's one ball and one strike. One and one on Croner. Once more, the pitcher starts to wind up. Easy swinging wind up throws. And Croner swings and misses for strike two. Ball curved away just a little bit, enough to miss the bat because he went after it pretty good, and it's one ball and two strikes. One and two. He again starts to wind up throws, and the hitter hits the ball right back through the box and into center field for a little rolling, dribbling single, but there's nobody anywhere near it, and it goes on through into center field for a base hit. Scoring Fox to make the score 5-3 to three in favor of Boston, leaving Croner on first base with nobody out. One run already home in the sixth inning. And Joe Cronin, the manager and shortstop, is up there at the plate. Cronin at bat. Joe swings the first one, hit a little pop foul. It bounds and hits the stand just before it gets to the Red Sox dugout, then bounds on down past it a little bit. Herb Pennock coaching at first base. Gets it, throws it back in the screen. Pitcher throws the next one, and it's a high one inside for ball one. So the count is one ball and one strike on Cronin. One and one, he hits the next one. The ball right back at Lyons, who throws it back to Hayes. And the runner came into second base standing up so that uh, Hayes couldn't throw to first. And now Hayes is insisting there was interference there. Because Croner came in and not only was standing up, but he came in with his arms outstretched and bumped right into Jackie. Appling also telling the umpire that he thought it was interference. And Luke Sewell goes walking out to ask umpire uh, Ormsby about it. And Ormsby points back toward the plate, tells him to go back there. And now Jimmy Dykes is running out on the field from the Sox bench to query the umpire about that first place. I don't think they could have gotten the man at first. The play had taken just long enough and Cronin was going down fast and uh, Dykes now walks out there and he's talking to umpire on Z, following him out to the grass and stands there talking to him. Hayes was pretty sore about that decision. He thought that he'd been interfered with because naturally Croner has a right to come in standing up if he wants. He doesn't have to get out of the way that way but Hayes claimed that when he came and bumped into him with his arms outstretched, he was blocking him and it constituted interference. I think the fact that he had his arms outstretched was merely to keep him from knocking Hayes over and knocking himself down because if he'd gone in without taking that precaution, there would have been some a bad collision. So whatever it is, it boys thought it was worth arguing for, but naturally nothing further happened. And as I said before, I don't think the runner would, would have been out at first anyway because Cronin was going down fast, and on the play, the infielders had to go for certain positions uh, on what they were playing for the hitter, and Lyons had to hold the ball before he could throw to second long enough to make the play possible. Now, in the very first 
pitch on the next ball. The next ball. <laughs> the lady fans are doing a bit of booing as umpire Armsby walks over toward the third base territory. He's been out of second base before, naturally, with a play out there. But Emmett was entirely within his right there, and there was no, to my mind, no visible interference. And uh, I think to everybody else's, but naturally everybody likes to holler a little. Now, on the first pitch to Werber, they put on a hit-and-run play. Werber bounced right back weakly into the infield. Lions threw him out at first base for the out. Cronin going to second. And here, Berg at bat hits the first ball pitch out to left center for a base hit. Previous gets the ball and throws it in right to the pitcher's mound, not toward the plate, so Lyons cuts it off, and another run scores. Berg looped a little technical leaguer out into left center, and it scored Cronin from second base to make it two runs this inning and a 6-3 to three lead for the Red Sox. F. Berg on first base, two out, two runs home, and Grove at bat hits the bounder. Lyons goes over beautifully to field the ball and throw the first for the out. That Lyons really feels the position out there as the books read it should be fielded. He does a beautiful, beautiful job. So it's two runs, three hits, one man left on base in the first half of the sixth inning. And the score is six to two, or six to three in favor of the Red Sox. White Sox coming to bat in the last half of the six. This broadcast, the White Sox Boston game, comes to you direct from Comiskey Park, home of the White Sox of Chicago, as a presentation of your neighborhood Texaco dealer, distributor of Texaco Fire Chief Gasoline. The broadcast comes with the permission of the White Sox and the Red Sox to simulate interest in our national game and in your own local baseball team. This is WCFL at Chicago. Luke Appling is up there now. The White Sox now have a three-run lead to overcome again. Ooh, Mr. Pennsylvania's run a little bit late. <laughs> also, Bob Tail, you know, just have too many cars out out there, about three cars. There was another one, <laughs> but he whistled anyway. Yes, sir, the Sox are three runs behind again. That's the way they started out in the first inning. They pulled up to within one run that inning and then went two runs behind and again pulled up within one run. Now... The Red Sox are three runs in front, leading 6-3. to three. White Sox at bat in the last half of the sixth inning. Luke Appling, the first hitter, a little warmed up the pitcher, and Berg is now out there. Grove gets his sign, starts his wind-up pitch, first one, Appling, throws... Luke swings to follow the ball on the ground to the left of the plate and over to the stand for strike one. One strike to count. And the pitch is ready again. Throws. And it's a high one inside for ball one. And the count is one ball and one strike on Apley. One and one. Field line is curving toward foul territory, but lands just inside the foul line and bounds into the grandstand, bounds out again, but having bounded into the stand by ground rules, it's a two-base hit. And Fyatt is on second base with two out of the sixth inning, and Luke Sewell is at best. for the first one and then tried to get away from it and the ball hit the bat and rolled bounced back hit the umpire's mask and then bounded away over the right almost to the dugout the umpire takes off the mask and shakes his head he has it back on again and they're ready to go once more school at bat fired on second base two out of the sixth inning score six to three in favor of the Red Sox and the hitter hits the next one Bounded off to Cronin, who grabs it, fumbles it momentarily, but recovers it and throws it to first, just barely nailing Sewell for the third out. And it's no run, one hit, one man left on base. 
in the last half of the sixth inning. The score remaining 6-3 in favor of the Boston Red Sox at the end of the sixth inning. And now once again for scores up to the minute and complete batteries from other cities, we return to the studio. In the National League in New York, the Chicago Cubs won their game from the Giants today by a score of 3-1. to one. They scored three runs, six hits, and one error to the Giants. One run, four hits, and one error. French and Hartnett, the Cub battery all the way. Gumbert and Mancuso starting for the Giants with Castleman pitching in the eighth. In Brooklyn, the St. Louis Cardinals and the Dodgers at the end of the seventh inning are tied 6 all. Dizzy Dean and Ogredowski working for the Cards. The Browns starting Brant and Berries with Phelps catching in the third. Winston pitching in the fourth and Baker on the mound in the fifth. In Boston... The Pittsburgh Pirates are leading the Bees at the end of the first half of the ninth inning by a score of 10 to 4. Weaver and Patton started for the Pirates with Hoyt pitching in the seventh. The Bees starting Chaplin and Lopez with Reese on the mound in the fifth. The first game of the doubleheader in Philadelphia was taken by the Cincinnati Reds from the Phils, 12 to 2. Davis and Lombardi, the Red Battery in the first game. The Phillies using Walter and Atwood with Harris in the sixth and Sivitz in the seventh. In the second game at the end of the first half of the fifth inning, the Phillies lead the Reds 4 to 2. Brennan and Campbell started for the Reds with shot in the fifth. Jorgens and Wilson working for the Phillies. In the American League, in Detroit, the Tigers lead the Washington Senators at the end of the first half of the four, fifth inning, 3-1. to one. Newsom and Millie's the Senator battery, the Tigers using Bridges and Hayward. In Cleveland, the New York Yankees lead the Indians at the end of the fourth inning, 3-2. to two. Adley and Dickey, the Yankee battery, the Indians starting harder in Pitlack, putting Gale House on the mound in the fifth. In St. Louis, the Browns lead the Philadelphia Athletics at the end of the first inning, 2 to nothing. Kelly and Hayes, the athletic battery, the Browns using Knott and Giuliani. And now back to Comiskey Park and Al Totten. Take it, Al. Back at the ballpark for the seventh inning, Dusty Cook at bat for the Red Sox has taken the first two pitches for ball. And there comes ball three, a high one wide. So it's three balls and no strikes on Cook. Three and nothing to count. Still winding up. Throws, and it's the ball four wide across the chest. Cook gets the base on ball. Him on first base. Nobody else in the seventh inning for the Red Sox. And Kramer is at bat. Roger Kramer up there at the plate. Throws the first one. Kramer bunts the ball, but it's fall to the left of the plate. And it's strike one. One strike on Rod. Cook goes back to first base and was practically all the way to second when he finally stopped up as that ball rolled foul. Now Lyons is ready, throws again, and Kramer bunts this one or tries to, but it tips the bat and goes foul clear back to stand, and it's still two strikes on Kramer. Throws once more. The hitter follows this one into the second deck above and the left of the plate. Rolls around in the aisle down here. And it's still two strikes on Roger Kramer. As Lyons gets ready once more. Pitches. Hitter hits the ball well out into left field. Ratcliffe comes in fast, but it lands well in front of him for another base hit. A single to left field by Kramer. Moving Cook to second base. The Red Sox have runners on first and second. Nobody out in the seventh inning. And Luke Sewell stands there looking at the bench and then back at the pitcher. But apparently, two boys in the bullpen are just going to keep on warming up for a minute. Lyons really hasn't shown any serious signs of weakening. Heine Manush is at bat. Reaches out and bunts the first one foul toward first base for strike one. One strike on Manush. Wait a moment while the two runners go strolling back to first and second. And they finally get there. She throws and Heine takes the ball and Sewell snaps the ball out to second base. But Cook dashed back there fast. And so there's no play. He beat the ball. One ball and one strike on Manush. Norris starts to sneak in a little bit now. She throws and Manush bunts the ball out in front of the plate. Lyons got to throw the first. Panora backing up to take the ball on the throw. And 
It's a good sacrifice by Heine. Play going from Lions to Benura for the first out in the seventh inning. And it brings the ever-dangerous Jimmy Fox to bat. They're going to walk Jim. They're going to walk Jimmy to take a chance on Croner, the next hitter. And it's the only play to make. The simple, oh, boy, he threw that one pretty close to plate for the second ball. This one well outside again. The Fox is too dangerous, and also in this stage of the game, with the club already three runs behind, the idea is to make force plays possible, double plays possible at any base, or by way of any base. And so they fill the bases intentionally, bring Croner, the second baseman to bat, the infield playing back. The infield playing back in normal position, outfield moved around a little bit to the left. That is a left field hitter. Ordinarily, and he swings the ball, the first one out of the roof of the stand above and to the right of the plate. One strike on Croner. And the pitcher throws again for a ball wide across the knees. It's one ball and one strike on Croner. One and one to count. Throws again, the hitter hits a long high fly to deep left center. Brad Clip and Pivich are going over after it, rips under it, makes the catch. The runner from third is scoring. Runner from second goes back to second when a long throw comes in from Brad Clip. But Cook scores to give the Red Sox a 7 to 3 lead in the seventh inning. Cook scores on Croner's long fly to Brad Clip. Or two out, one run home, and runners on first and second. For the Red Sox, still watching second base throws, and it's a strike on Cronin over the outside corner about knee high. One strike on Joe. Throws again, and Cronin falls the ball into the stand to the right of the plate, and it's two strikes on Cronin. Two strikes to count. Lions takes another look at second, then pitches. Cronin swings in a high fly in the center field. Krevich is in there waiting for it. Has it. And it's three out. And Lions pulled out of that inning with just one, one more and more run scoring. Although the way the inning started, it looked as though more damage than that was going to happen. Of course, one run, one hit, two men left on base. In the first half of the seventh inning, the crowd is up for the seventh inning stretch. As the White Sox come in the bat in the last half of the seventh, Ed Lyons, the first hitter, to score 7-3 to three in favor of the Red Sox. Morrissey, Joe Morrissey, is going to bat for Ted Lyons to start the last half of the seventh inning. The broadcast of the White Sox-Boston game comes to you direct from Comiskey Park, home of the White Sox in Chicago, as a presentation of your neighborhood Texaco dealer, distributor of Texaco Fire Chief Gasoline. The broadcast comes with the permission of the White Sox and the Red Sox Stimulate interest in our national game and in your own local baseball team. This is WCFL at Chicago. Morrissey, rangy right-handed hitter, stands there at the plate waiting as the second baseman has a little confab with Grove and then trots back to his position. Winds up and throws now, and the pitch is so low and inside that it gets away from the catcher and goes clear back to the stand. And it's one ball called on Morrissey. Put it all over, George. Going to have to put it all over, Bob Burns. No, not today. <laughs> one ball called. Grove throws again, and Morrissey gets a good strike. It's over the inside corner, about waist high, and it makes it one ball and one strike on Morrissey. One and one. He throws again, and Morris, he swings in a long high fly out to left field, but the left fielder, Manush, is under it. He has it, and it's one out of the seventh inning. Out of the seventh inning for the start, and Radcliffe is at bat. Rip Radcliffe up there at the plate. Throw 
goes and Rip takes a strike over the heart of the plate, waist high. One strike on Radcliffe. Grove has the sign again, winds up. Pitches and the hitter swings in a foul way down the right field line and back into the seat. And it's two strikes on the Ripper. Rip hasn't had a base hit so far today, been up three times. Batting average is going to take a beat this afternoon against this fellow, looks like. Two strikes on Rip. Grove again winds up pitches. And it's a high one wide for ball one, making it one ball and two strikes. On Radcliffe. One and two. Remember the doubleheader here Sunday with the Red Sox. There's the next one wide and low for ball two. So it's two balls and two strikes on Radcliffe. Two and two. She again takes that easy wind up throws. And the ripper follows the ball right back toward us. Lands down here in the seats right in front of Uncle George over here in the booth. The bounce back down amongst the fans. George almost fell out of that booth trying to reach that one. And it's two and two. Two balls and two strikes. Which again winds up, throws, and it's ball three. Inside and low in the count is three balls and two strikes on Radcliffe. Three and two, and he hits the next one. There's his base hit, a drive out to right field, drops in there for a good base hit, makes the turn, but the ball is fielded fast by Cook, who throws it into second base, holding the ripper at first. Single to right field by Radcliffe, putting him on first base, one out in the seventh inning, and Mike Pevich is at bat. Hitter swings the first one. It's a little bounder out to Fox, who gets it, throws the second, forcing Radcliffe sliding in there, but there's no chance to make a play at first. That leaves Krivich on first base. We have two out in the seventh inning, and Muehlhaus at bat takes the first pitch wide for ball one. One ball called. He's waiting there again for the sign. Leans over as he gets it, cuts the ball in front of him, watches the runner, then pitches for a good strike over the outside corner knee high, and it's one and one. Just one old teammate pitching to another one down here. So pitching to Haas. Boy, you could make a pretty good ball club of the old athletics out of these two teams here this afternoon. Put the Detroit club to it, and you have almost all the old A's right there. Next pitch is a strike, and the count is two, or a ball, rather, a high and wide, and the count is two balls, and one strike on Hawk. Two and one. Both throws again, and Hawk swings, hit the ball out toward left field. Cronin makes a great, great play. Oh, a beautiful play by Cronin who made a great backhanded stop of the ball, whirled and threw to second in time to get Krivich for the third out. One of the best plays I've ever seen Cronin make, and he's made some beauty. But that one was everything a play should be to be absolutely sensational. Looks as though that ball was going to go through into left field. But Cronin, dashing to his right and way back, made a backhanded stab of the ball, whirled, leaped into the air, and while in the air, threw to second accurately, forcing Krivich there by less than a step for the third out. A pretty, pretty play. No runs, one hit, one man left on base in the first half of the seventh inning. And the score is still 7-3 to three in favor of the Red Sox at the end of the seventh inning. You can buy your gasoline just as scientifically as the United States government itself. Texaco Fire Chief Gasoline meets the government requirements for the faster pickup, extra power, and speed that emergency vehicles must have. So take a tip from Uncle Sam. Use emergency-type gasoline. Fill up with Fire Chief. The applause while I was saying that was caused by the fact that the announcement of the pitcher is 
new pitcher revealed that Bill Shores is making his first appearance as a member of the White Sox. He's a pitcher that joined the team a couple of days ago after Red Evans was sent out to Kansas City and Shores brought in. Shores is formerly with the Philadelphia Athletics when Jimmy Dykes and the boys were there. was with him for several years and did some pretty good pitching. He hasn't uh, had any sensational record at Kansas City this year, but is a smart pitcher who knows what it's all about, and Jimmy felt that a man of his type for relief work would be a little more valuable than a man with the inexperience of Evans when Evans could be out there pitching regularly and getting back in the form that made him such a sensation in a league of lower classification last year, although I wouldn't say made lower classification, but plays mighty fast ball in Texas League. Shore's first pitch to Werber is a strike over the outside corner, waist high, Bill winds up again, throws a curveball wide that gets away from Sewell, rolls away, and it's one and one. One and one the count. But he winds up again, throws, and the hitter swings to foul the ball into the stands to the right of the plate, and it's one and two. One ball and two strikes on Werber. Shores has the sign again. He's winding up. Throws. And it's another curveball outside, making it two and two. Shores, a pretty big fellow, right-hander. Has one of those windmill wind-ups with a semi-pivot as he winds up. Starts it with a swinging wind-up before he gets his arms twisting over his head. And then he throws the next one for ball three. It's inside and low, and the count is three balls and two strikes on Werber. And he swings the next hit, a line drive to left field, but Radcliffe comes in nicely to get the ball for the first out of the eighth inning. Rip came in fast and was waiting for it, catching it down about even with his knees. And it's one out of the eighth inning for the Red Sox with Moberg, the Boston catcher, already has a single and a triple this afternoon and has driven in two runs. Moberg at bat. Doris winds up, throws. And Moe gets another hit, drive out into left center, and Radcliffe tries to get it, but it goes on through to the scoreboard, where Kreevich gets a hold of it, throws it back in, and Bird pulls up at second base. So he has a single, a double, and a triple so far this afternoon. Now, if you should hit one out of the park, he had the old familiar hitting the cycle, the old term they use when the hitter goes all the way around, gets a double, single, double, triple, and home run in one day. The ball players call that hitting the cycle. Berg on second base, one out in the eighth inning, and Lefty Grove at bat. Shores throws, and Lefty swings and misses a fast one inside for strike one. One strike on Shore on the Grove. First half of the eighth inning, Red Sox leading seven to three. Time is suddenly called when umpire Ormsby at third base sees a warm-up ball from the Washington or from the Boston bullpen. I'm getting my geography mixed up here. Roll out into right field. Call time while it's retrieved, but now they're ready to go again. And there's a strike over the outside corner, waist high. Grove let it go by. So it's two strikes on Grove. Throws now, and the hitter swings and misses a curveball outside, striking out for the second out of the eighth inning. So it's two out of the eighth inning for the Red Sox. Berg is still on second base, and the leadoff man, Dusty Cook, is up there at the plate. Throws the first one, and Dusty takes a strike over the heart of the plate, plays high. Might add that this fellow had the same kind of an operation that Walker, Dixie Walker of the White Sox just had on his shoulder, and it worked very successfully. Cook swings hard at the next one, missing it, or strike two. He tried to stop his swing, but he was all the way around on the ball when he finally got the bat stopped up. And while he 
seems a little bit disappointed that he didn't get the benefit of that decision. He realizes he had that bat well around before he tried to get it out of the way of the full swing. So it's two strikes on Cook. Torres throws again, and Cook swings and misses the third ball inside, striking out for the third out. And that Torres showed me something that time. He showed me a fastball, and he showed me a change of pace, and then a slow curve. On one after another, and he really had Cook hanging on ropes. He didn't know just what he was going to get up there next. No runs, one hit, one man left on base in the first half of the eighth inning, and the score is still 7-3 to three in favor of the Red Sox as the White Sox come to bat in the last half of the eighth inning with Benura, the first man at bat. I want to call the heart back to one decision that happened while our good friend Frank Payne was broadcasting a little earlier. Frank, did you uh, make any special comment about that play when Hayes was caught off second base back in the fourth inning? That was one of the best umpiring decisions I ever saw. And it is the second or third one that I've seen umpire McGowan pull of exactly the same sort. Umpire McGowan is one of the best arbiters I've ever seen work. And he's one of these fellows who long ago learned the secret of keeping your eye on the ball all the time. That ball was thrown back to second base by the catcher with Cronin getting it in an attempt to catch him off. Hayes got back in time, but the catcher's balance, his foot momentarily lifted off the bag, keep from falling down, and as it came off, Conan, who still had the ball on him, had him out, and umpire McGowan, who just stood there, bent right over it, watching every move, lifted his arm instantly to indicate out. And it was one of those alert decisions that makes umpiring really something interesting to watch if it's done right. And umpire McGowan deserves all kinds of commendations for following that ball, keeping his eye on it, and not missing a play that would have been pretty bad to miss, but he was watching it, and he had it all the way. Honora, the first man up, hits an easy bounder back to second base, where Cronin gets it and throws the first, and it's one out of the eighth inning. Appling at bat takes the first pitch high and wide for a ball. One ball called. And the pitcher again starts to wind up, throws. Luke swings in a ball down to Werber, who gets it, throws the first, and Appling is out for the second out of the eighth inning. Makes a two out in the eighth inning for the White Sox, and Jackie Hayes, White Sox second baseman, is at bat. Grove winds up, throws the first one. Jackie pushed away to take the curveball inside for ball one. One ball called. Throws again, and there's a strike over the outside corner, knee high. And so it's one ball and one strike on Hayes. One and one to count. There's another one. It's wide and low for ball two. So it's two and one on Hayes. Two balls and one strike. Throws again, and Jackie swings it, an easy bounder back at Cronin, who gets it. Throws the first, and Hayes is out for the third out, making it no runs and no hits in the eighth inning for the White Sox. And the score is still 7-3 to three in favor of Boston at the end of the eighth inning. The Grove has pitched great ball since the first inning. He gave up three hits there and two runs. The other run scored on him in the fourth was due directly to a pair of errors and indirectly to uh, two bases on balls with the issue. So that's the way that turned out. Out. Mexico scorebook to you. Scorebook containing the regular official blank. Complete score spot for some 15 years or so with illustrations and full explanations. Pictures of the White Sox and Cubs, their rosters and schedules. And you can get this book as just as simply as Anything can be gotten just about. I don't know of a much simpler way. Stop in at any Texaco service station. Ask for a request card. Fill it in. 
Put a one cent stamp on it and mail it. It's already addressed. And you'll get your book. The only information asked is your name and address. If there's been any delay in anybody getting the books, as I said before, let me know and we'll see that those books are delivered in a great big hurry. Naturally, with the volume of books going out, a few of them may be delayed, but not very many. Kramer Pratt takes Shore's first pitch for a strike over the outside corner waist high. Bill throws again, and the hitter follows the ball into the stand of the left of the plate, and it's two strikes on Kramer, another former teammate of his. Two former Philadelphia men are pitching right now. Bill throws again, and the hitter swings it along fly to center field. Kramer is going back easily. He's under it, has it. And it's one out in the ninth inning for the Red Sox. One out in the ninth inning, and Heine Manush is up there at the plate. Manush at bat. But you're getting his sign, starts to wind up. Throws and Heine, woo, that ball sailed right up toward his shoulder. And he twisted away from the fast to take it high and inside for ball one. One ball called. She again starts to wind up throws and Heine swings another high fly to center. And Kravich is waiting right there. He has it. And it's two out in the ninth inning. Two out in the ninth inning for the Red Sox with Jimmy Fox at bat. Fox up there at the plate, but she starts to wind up. Throws, and Jimmy started a swing stop, but the ball is over the plate for a strike. Over the inside corner, waist high, on another one of those slow, tantalizing curves. Fox started after it stopped, but it was too late. Now he swings hard, and another slow one, and misses it for a strike two. Shores didn't mix at that time. He threw another one just like the last. Fox went around too fast. So it's two strikes on Jim. Shores throws again, a curve ball wide and low for ball one. And it's one ball and two strikes on Jimmy Fox. One and two to count. Hitter swings again. It's a drive out into right center for another long base hit. The right fielder, Haas, goes over after it fast, manages to pick it up, drops it again, picks it up, and throws it in. And it's a two-base hit for Fox. He's got a double, a triple, and a home run today. So far, didn't come up with any single to complete his cycle. He did have a walk, perfectly issued pass in the seventh inning, or he might have had it. Can't. Yeah. So Fox is on second base, two out of the ninth, and Kroner swings hard at the first pitch to miss it for strike one. One strike at the count. Throws again, and Kroner swings it. A pop fly coming down back of the plate. Sewell is jogging back after it. Has it. And it's three out, ending that inning with no run, one hit, one man left on base in the ninth inning. And the score is still seven to three in favor of the Red Sox as the White Sox come to bat in the last half of the ninth inning with Tony Fias, the first White Sox hitter. Remember, as I said before, the Red Sox and White Sox play a single game here tomorrow, but... A doubleheader on Sunday. Imagine most of you have your tickets, those of you who got reserved seat tickets, but remember, 40,000 tickets are placed on sale, not reserved on the day of the game, and I imagine plenty of you people are going to be out here because that's going to be really a battle for third place. The White Sox do not manage to win this ball game. They've got a tough road to hold and do win tomorrow. Why, they'll be back having a chance to clinch third place for a day or so, maybe longer. I am that Sunday doubleheader, so you better all make it a point to be here. Also, it's getaway day for the Sox, who started swinging around the western end of the circuit. Next week, he's gone for a week before coming back again. Grove winds up now, throws, and it's inside and glow for ball one. He's a rather uh, fired at bat, jumped out of the way of that one. And it's one strike on Tony. 
Cove again starts to wind up pitches, and Tony gets strike two. That's over the... Wait a minute. I'm, I'm trying to add up hits here, and I'm getting my counts all wrong. Boys, give me help. It's strike one, and the other one was ball one. So it's one and one now. And here's Grove's next pitch for a foul onto the roof of the stand above and to the right of the plate. It's one and two. One ball and two strikes on Tony Pyatt. Ball and two strikes. And there's the second ball that misses that inside corner about waist high, drops out of the catcher's glove, rolls out in front of the plate. Bird goes out and gets it, throws it back to Grove, and it's two and two. It's winding up once more. Throws and Tony takes ball three, very high and very wide, and it's three balls and two strikes on five. And to the count. Here comes the fourth ball inside. Well, Matt got the base on ball. Puts him on first base. Nobody out of the ninth inning for the White Sox. And Luke Sewell is at best. Luke Sewell up there. Grove looks at first base throws, and Luke takes a strike over the heart of the plate, waist high. So Jimmy Dyke is going to be up here to... Well, to keep it in that old ex-athletic family. Grove waiting there again for his sign. As it pitches, and Sewell swings and misses a high fastball inside for strike two. Two strikes on Luke Sewell. Quiet on first base. Nobody out in the ninth inning. And Sewell swings the next in a slow bounder. Down to the third baseman. Werber gets it, throws the first. And Sewell is out by a step for the first out of the ninth. Werber made a corking good throw across there on that slow bounder. And now the lady fans here on Ladies Day are giving Dykes a great hand as he walks up there even before he's announced. They have him spotted. Even a bigger ovation takes place. And Jim takes the first pitch line inside for ball one. One ball called. Remember, the Red Sox are leading seven to three in the last half of the night. Hyatt is on second base with one out. Jimmy Dykes is back with one ball called. And there comes a good strike over the heart of the plate, waist high, to make it one and one. One ball and one strike. Throws again, and it curves inside by the knees for ball two, making it two balls and one strike on Jimmy Dyke. Two and one. Two balls and one strike. Grove ready, throws, and Jim starts to swing, tried to stop. The ball hit the bat and went down to box for an easy play there. Grove went over to cover. Dykes gets down there and makes some remark to Fox and starts kidding some of the other boys over there on the Boston bench. Tell them how lucky they were to get him out that way because he tried to dodge that ball and went out the same as... Who was it? Went out for... Was Werber went out for Boston the same way in the fourth inning. On, he tried to duck a ball and resulted in the line drive for Nora. And now Radcliffe at bat takes a high one wide for ball one. Fine, of course, went to third base on that infield out, that last one. Grove winds up again, pitches for ball two, it's inside and low, and the count is two and nothing. Two balls and no strikes. On Radcliffe. Throws again, and Rip takes a strike over the inside corner, waves high, and it's two and one. Two balls and one strike on the Ripper. Winding up. Throws and Radcliffe swings hit a slow bounder toward right field. Toner gets it. Throws the first. And it's three out. And the ball game is over with Boston winning 
by a score of 7-3. to three. No runs, no hits, one man left on base. The last half of the ninth inning. The totals, the Red Sox had seven runs, 13 hits, two errors, and they had seven men left on the bases. White Sox had three runs, seven hits, and no errors, and they had seven men left on the bases. Time of the game was announced as 152. Well, I thought 151, but I was only sort of trying to guess on account of watching my watch, not any stopwatch or anything like that. The winning pitcher was Grove, the losing pitcher, Lyon. Totals again, Boston seven runs, 13 hits, two errors, seven men left on bases. White Sox, three runs, seven hits, no errors, with seven men left on bases. Winning pitcher, Grove. Losing pitcher, Lyon. Time of the game, an hour and 52 minutes. Tomorrow, a single game between the White Sox and Boston. And Sunday, a doubleheader between the White Sox and the Red Sox. If we'll we see any out here, or if not here, we hope on the air, but that's all for now. I'm speaking for George as well as myself. Al Cotton bid you good afternoon from Comiskey Park, and we return to the studio. Bye now. Speaking to from the studio, ladies and gentlemen. We're bringing now a summary of the other baseball games that were played this afternoon. First in the National League, in New York, the Chicago Cubs won their game from the Giants by a score of 3-1. to one. The Cubs scored three runs, six hits and one error. The Giants one run, four hits and one error. French and Hartnett was the battery for the Cubs all the way. The Giants using Gumbert and Mancuso to open, putting Castleman on the mound in the eighth. In Brooklyn, the St. Louis Cardinals set the Dodgers down by a score of 8-6. to six. Eight runs, 11 hits, two errors. The Dodgers had six runs, 11 hits, and two errors. Dizzy Dean and Ogradowski worked for the cards all the way. Brandon Berry's open for the Dodgers. Self catching in the third. Winston pitching in the fourth. And Baker on the mound in the fifth. In Boston, the Pittsburgh Pirates trounced the Bees 10 to 5. When they scored 10 runs, 14 hits, and one error, to the Bees, five runs, 13 hits, with no error. Weaver and Patton started off for the Pirates with Hoyt pitching in the seventh. The Bees started Chaplin and Lopez, putting Reese on the mound in the fifth. In Philadelphia, in the first game of the doubleheader between the Phillies and the Cincinnati Reds, the Reds came off victorious 12-2, to two, scoring 12 runs, 14 hits, and one error. For the Phillies, two runs, six hits, and two errors. Davis and Lombardi, the battery all the way for the Reds. The Phillies opening with Walters and Atwood, putting Harris on the mound in the seventh and Cybus hurling in the seventh. In the second game of the Twin Bill, at the end of the first half of the seventh inning, the Phillies lead the Reds by a score of 5-2. to two. Brennan and Campbell open for the Reds in the second game with Schott going in in the fifth and Stein hurling in the seventh. Jorgens and Wilson still the battery for the Phillies. In the National League today, Klein of the Phillies had a home run in the seventh inning of the second game for his 18th of the year. Medrick of the Cardinals had a home run in the first inning with one on for his 15th. Lieber of the Giants had a home run in the fourth. Berger of the Bees had two home runs today, one in the seventh and one in the ninth, for a total of 17 home runs for the year. He had his 16th and 17th today. Camelli of the Phillies had a home run in the fifth for his 20th homer. Now in the American League, in Detroit, the Tigers are leading the Washington Senators at the end of the first half of the seventh inning by a score of 5-2. to two. Newsom and Millies working for the Senators, the Tigers using Bridges and Hayward. In Cleveland... The New York Yankees are leading the Indians at the end of the sixth inning by a score of 7-3. to three. Hadley and Dickey, the battery for the Yanks. The Indians starting Harder and Pitlack. Gale House hurling in the fifth. And Blay Holder, the pitcher, in the seventh. In St. Louis, the Browns lead the Philadelphia Athletics at the end of the first half of the fourth inning. Four to one. Kelly and Hayes, the pitcher and catcher for the Athletics. The Browns using Knott on the mound and Giuliani behind the bat. In the American League today, Fox of the Red Sox. Had a home run in the first inning of the ball with two men on base for his 30th of the year. Roth of the Yankees. Fifth, Gehrig of the Yankees. The league leader, literally home, learned to run in the sixth inning. For every mile you drive in the family car, buses travel hundreds of miles. The nation's highways, the city streets, literally hum day and night with motor bus travel. Leading bus companies use technical products because they have learned by actual test that they're more economical to use. In fact, each year for the past six years, users of technical products have won highest bus transportation awards for maintenance and operating efficiency. 
This fact is important to you because bus companies are large consumers of gasoline and motor oil, and they have to show operating profits. It will certainly pay you to follow the lead of large buyers of gasoline, such as America's leading bus companies, who know how to get greater motoring values at least cost per mile. Make all your purchases at the Texaco Fire Chief Pump. The Texaco Fire Chief gasoline sold there is the same type of gasoline demanded by the United States government for special use in fire engines, ambulances, and police cars. It costs no more than ordinary gasoline. So next time, try Fire Chief. Your neighborhood Texaco service station has brought you this broadcast from Comiskey Park by permission of the Chicago White Sox and the Boston Red Sox to stimulate interest in our national game and in your local team. Red Fowler speaking for the Texas Company. Invite you to tune in tomorrow afternoon at 2.45 for another baseball broadcast with Hal Totten at the microphone. And whenever you hear the siren and bell, think of Texaco. This is the voice of labor.